Good afternoon, uh, and welcome to today's lunch hour lecture. My name is Patricia Rothman. I'm a member of the lunch hour lecture committee. Um, today, um, Dr. Mariam Sharmanesh has kindly agreed to give the lecture at fairly short notice as the previous lecturer had to have surgery. So we're very delighted to have her here today. Um, on Thursday, uh, the lunch hour lecture is being given by Professor Maxine Molyneux, and it's on gender equality and women's rights in Latin America. But uh, for today, um, uh, Dr. Sharmanesh um, uh, qualified in Cambridge and did her specialist training in sexual health and HIV in London. Uh, she has a particular interest in testing novel interventions to improve access for care to chronic diseases, particularly for marginalized populations such as female sex workers. Um, she is actively involved in postgraduate training, and she's also a clinician in one of the largest sexual health and HIV clinics in the UK. Um, Dr. Shamanesh. Hi. Um, thank you for coming, and it's a real honor to talk, because I know this week is around um, the 8th of March, and I think it's particularly apt, because 8th of March, of course, is International Women's Day, but originally it was International Women, Working Women's Day, and I think it's quite apt to talk about sex work, which has always been ambiguous in terms of whether it's work or not. So I'm going to basically give you some background as to why I'm talking about this topic at such short notice, and then try and take out two contrasting narratives in two neighboring states in India, which show coercive versus slightly permissive approaches to sex work and some of the implications. Now, it's quite difficult to pitch it at a level that everybody will like, and I hope that most of it's understandable for everybody. And I think if there's any kind of social scientist, you'll find the social science very simplistic, so I apologize up front before you start challenging it. So as you all know, HIV is a very common condition and still a global problem. Um, about 34 million people around the world or more with HIV, and majority are in sub-Saharan Africa. But if you notice, because South and Southeast Asia has such a high population, the actual burden of disease is quite high into, you know, four million is a lot of people. But you may have also seen there's a sort of renewed optimism around the future of HIV. So the first few decades, there was sort of a pessimism about whether we could control the HIV epidemic, and suddenly there's this renewed optimism sort of exemplified by this very dramatic front page in The Economist, which said that the end of AIDS, are we going to see the end of AIDS? Now, I'll just give you a little bit of information as to where this optimism is coming from. So, as you can see from here, these are some, all of these interventions. So, the first couple of decades was relatively pessimistic in terms of every intervention that was tried didn't really show any impact on HIV prevention until more recently there have been several large randomized controlled trials which showed biomedical interventions which are effective. The most extreme up here, where if you take discordant couples, so an HIV positive partner who's having sex with an HIV negative partner, where the positive partner was given antiretroviral therapy before they needed it, so treatment to treat their HIV, almost 100% of their partners didn't get HIV, so a very effective intervention, but mainly around medicines. Again, if you look down further here, you'll see the, va the variation down here, the 40 to 60% are a series of interventions, again using antiretroviral therapy, but this time in the negative partner, using it either as a vaginal gel or as an oral tablet to protect themselves against HIV with varying effect, probably re representing the varying adherence to those treatments. And if you see right at the bottom, vaccines remain an elusive and very ineffective intervention. Circumcision should be in there as well, and that will be somewhere up there. So all of these are biomedical interventions based on individuals, so one individual gets them. And you may ask, why am I talking about structural interventions? Why am I talking about society? And just kind of very simplistically, you have to remember this, the individual is in the middle. So the individual has to take that treatment if the treatment is to work. It has to get to the individual in the first place. They have to believe in it. They have to want to take it. They have to believe they want to be, not catch HIV. They have to take it for a very long time. And it has to continue to be taken. So that, these interventions, even though they might be individually based, they still require a whole plethora governmental, societal, community, and even interpersonal relationships to be effective. So it doesn't take away the fact that we still need to look at the structures and society within which these interventions are being given if we want it to work. And do we have any real life evidence for that? Well, we do. We know that there has been a decline in HIV incidence globally. It's been the most positive thing that we've seen in the past few years that a 
number of new infections was a quarter down in the last years, which is very, very positive. However, there are groups that remain very much outside of that positive message. And a very good systematic review done of all sex workers in lower middle income countries showed that as a female sex worker, you are 14 times more likely to have HIV than a woman in the general population. And this isn't, so this is your likelihood of having it. And are we doing anything about it? Even though it's three decades into knowing that just very simple interventions such as condom use and provision of sexually transmitted infection interventions in Nairobi reduce the incidence in HIV in sex workers quite dramatically. Less than 50% of women receive those interventions. In fact, only one in 10 countries achieve a coverage of more than 50% with their sex workers. So we're very far off reaching people. So even if we have this fantastic magic bullet, the microbicide or the tablet or the vaccine or an injection which stops HIV, we're still not reaching the people that need it most. So we still need to look at what are those barriers. Why India? Well, partly, although India's prevalence is not particularly high, so it's less than 1% at the general population level, it still is a country which has got a large population, so that's 2.5 million people which will need treatment. But more than that, it's a very complex epidemic, it's very heterogeneous, but it still remains very much concentrated in groups which are considered to be high risk, so people who, are, for whatever reason, are more exposed to HIV. And this is shown by this... And in, in India in particular, sex work is an important group in that setting of high-risk groups, partly because their prevalence is very high. So almost one in 100 adult female population engage in transactional sex in India. So it's a large population, a bit reminiscent possibly of Victorian London, if any of you have read the stuff around Victorian London. And more strikingly and worryingly, a woman who's engaged in sex work, so is exchanging sex for money, is 50 times more likely in India to have HIV than a woman from a general population. So a very concentrated epidemic with a very vulnerable group. Models have suggested that if this group are targeted well, the HIV incidence will drop, and there is some empirical evidence that this is happening. So I'm just gonna digress a little bit to sort of explain the terminology I'll be using. As I said, it'll be quite simplistic for true sociologists and anthropologists in the audience, but forgive me. By community mobilization, what we're talking about is the process in which marginalized groups, or groups that don't have much social and political capital, don't have much control over their destinies for whatever political reason, mobilize together, come together, try and challenge those structures of power. And then empowerment gets thrown around a lot. I'm empowered to do this, I'm empowered to do that. In this context, I'm taking a kind of 1960s view of it in a way. So if you rem remember the rainbow coalitions of the 60s, you know, black power, uh, gay liberation, women's liberation, where groups of people who traditionally hadn't got as much social and political capital as they had before, identified as a group, identified as being a person who doesn't have social and political capital, got together, so from collective identity, got together as a group, and then worked towards changing some of those structures, which we would call collective agency. So it's a process of politicization. And empowerment in this context, this is how we're discussing it. And there is some work um, in terms of the development sphere to look at empowerment in kind of the village structure being effective in terms of improving some of the um, social outcomes. In India, the theory has been around the fact that some of the successes which they've seen in terms of HIV interventions in recent years in southern India have been attributed to some very successful community mobilization efforts, both in Karnataka, but particularly in uh, West Bengal, Sonagachi, where women themselves organized to challenge some of the structures of power. So that is the sort of model in which it's being taken. But even in that same context, where this seems to have been the model that was being taken forward in South India, you had equally at the same time very coercive approaches to sex work. There were the closing of the dance bars in Bombay, and there was the demolition of Baina, which I'll talk about later. So you get these, these two tendencies, a very populist coercive approach towards sex work, and a more public health um, harm reduction approach at the same time. But there are also some unknowns in the story of community mobilization. To what degree, it may take many forms, people do it in different ways, what is it that works and what is the mechanism through which it works? And what's the impact of the opposite? Do the coercive policies that we say are bad, do they actually have a negative impact? And are there frameworks in which we can use to describe this? So for the purpose of our, to look at the empirical data that we had, we used a sort of fairly simplistic conceptual model because we're epidemiologists. And what we said is if you imagine those three parameters of power that we talked about in empowerment, power within would be how you have a self-identity and develop self-esteem. Power with would be a group of people getting together and trying to do something with that 
improve self-esteem. And power over resources would be that you would need some resources, whether they're financial or technical, to do something about it. And that would hopefully work towards addressing some of the power imbalances in your society that excludes you as a sex worker and makes you vulnerable to HIV. But we are very aware that none of this happens in a vacuum. And you have socio-demographic issues that may not be changeable. Your age you can't change, your caste you can't change, your class you rarely can change in most settings. But there are sex work organisation aspects that do change, and there are programme and structural interventions which can change. That can include changing the legal structure of a country, can changing how the police approach sex work, or can be things around um, in interventions which provide health services. So those are factors which will be influencing this process. Coming to India, just to remind you of where we are. So Goa is that tiny little state on the west coast of India. And Karnataka is this incredibly large state which surrounds Goa, the very tiny state. So Karnataka is a big state, has a population of 60 million, so it's almost as big as Britain. And the sex work popu population there is about 100,000. In 2003, the Bill and Melinda Gates um, Foundation introduced a very large um, intervention called Avahan, in which they funded it in 20 districts. So these were the pink ones, and they're the very high prevalence districts in Karnataka. And it was a very huge, massive scale-up intervention. And the components were the things that had been identified in previous studies to work for sex workers. So part of it was community mobilization, which had been shown to work in Sonagachi. So the idea was to get women organized and collectivized as best as they can and to facilitate that process. And then 40,000 women had been collectivized in that process. 100,000 women were reached with these huge outreach programs, large numbers of sexual health clinics, but also some work around police and legal systems. So trying to make the system much more enabling. In contrast, Goa, that small state that we discussed on the other side, although it only has a population of 1.4 million, it actually is epidemiologically probably more important than it seems. During the months of March, of November to March, is the tourist season in, in, in Goa, and about 1 million tourists from around the world, but also around India, visit for tourism. And during that same time, an equal number of migrant workers, around 1 million, also visit to service the tourists that come. So you have a huge seasonal migration for just four or five months a year of about nearly two million people. So it is a very complex place. And in 2004, this red light area, which was around this area, by the beach, and had been there since the 1960s, was bulldozed. So we're looking at two different aspects. The way the study was done was using a mixture of qualitative and ethnographic mod methods, as well as looking at very large survey data that, has been, that is available in India. And in Karnataka, what we were looking at is what are the models of community mobilization in sex workers? Is there an association between that community mobilization, empowerment, and HIV risk using that framework that we discussed? And is there any measurable impact on access to services? And the models of community mobilization, as you would imagine, were very different depending on where people were. So in some places, it was predominantly a microfinance model where people got together around a corporation or microfinance initiative. So it was getting power over resources as the reason why the women got together. Whereas in other settings like the self-help group or the support group, there was a lot more around that sort of idea of self-identity and collective action to change things. The cultural intervention at the bottom was really, really disempowered and disenfranchised, fragmented women who were so scared to even express being a sex work where they were actually brought together in, in groups of um, around kind of a, a, a death or a celebration. So even just coming out and being able to come to celebration was a big change in terms of their lives. So there were very different models in which people came together to develop these corporations. So then we looked at whether there was a difference in these measures of empowerment that we talked about, so power within, power with others, and power over resources, depending on how much mobilization was happening in a setting. So if you take the blue ones, so Solapur and Darwood, those were the, the areas in Karnataka where there was much less community mobilization. The concentration of community mobilization was much less. Women were not members of collectives as much. And in all the different measures, we found that as the amount of collectivization was higher, as the amount of mobilization was higher, there was greater degree of power within, power with others, and power over resources. Equally, when we looked at measures of community of, of exposure to programs, so if you took how long since a woman had been exposed to one of these forms of mobilization and compared that with power within and power with, you see there's a sort of gradation from the longer they were, from six months to one year to over two years, the more they expressed markers of power within and power with. Again, this, this held true of any measure of amount of exposure that we used. 
We also looked at sexual health outcomes, sexual health being a marker of recent behaviour. And we found that in the women who are members of community-based organisations, the prevalence of STIs and HIV was broadly less. That's the green. And then using some fancy mathematical things that I won't go into in great deal of detail, we tried to look at comparing those that were members of community-based organisations with those that weren't, adjusting for things that might make them inherently different. Uh, to see whether there are differences. And you'll find that women who were members of a community-based organization, this is in about 5,000 women, were 10% less likely to experience violence, 10% less likely to experience uh, police coercion, 10% more likely to access social entitlements, like being a widow or various other social welfare things they could access. And they had 10% less chlamydia and gonorrhea, sexually transmitted infections, again suggesting there was something happening. So, in the first story, there is a suggestion that both at the concentration of community mobilization at district level, but also the degree of exposure at individual level is associated with these measures of empowerment, and that these measures of empowerment were associated with greater service utilization. But also the membership of the CBO itself meant that you had a more enabling environment and reduced STIs. Remember, these are in cross-sectional studies, so the direction of effect is not straightforward. We come to the parallel story happening at the same time, just across the border in Goa. So here, a demolition was happening. And we wanted to see how did this impact on the context of sex work, and was, did this have a negative impact on the environment in which sex work happens? So this is Baina, and unfortunately, in June 2004, despite very, very active advocacy on behalf of the whole country, as well as those of us that were living and working in Goa at the time, the High Court the, the government of Goa demolished this area. It made 8,000 people homeless, so it was, it was a very dramatic event. And the question is, how did this happen? Exactly at the same time, as very different approach was being taken over the border in Karnataka and also over the border in uh, West Bengal. And I think it's important to bear in mind the legal context, and we sometimes forget, and as epidemiologists and clinicians, we need to remember the legal context can change. But in India, although sex work itself, so the selling of sex is not illegal, brothels are illegal, and that is because to a degree, the Immoral Trafficking Prevention Act, which is a relic of the <coughs> British um, legal system, conflates sex work with trafficking. And therefore, this creates a sort of ambiguous situation in which the High Court's judgment to demolish the area was well within the legal remit. There were brothels there, so therefore they had the right to demolish the brothels, even if that meant making people homeless. The other thing which I think is something we again forget and happens quite frequently in the West as well is that broadly speaking the feminist movements and social reformist movements have had a very uncomfortable feeling towards sex work. It's inherently felt to be inherently degrading to women the selling of sex. Uh, many women find it uncomfortable as feminists to in any way relate to that. And it was actually a social activist who was really worried about the conditions that people were living in Baina who took the case to the High Court. Her aim was to try and introduce some positive things to make people's lives better but outside of her control, it ended up being a demolition. And there's a complication in which the social reformist movement, even at the time of demolition in Goa, didn't fully come behind the women's right to live where they lived. And finally, Goa, the BJP took power at that time. So a religious fundamentalist government had taken power. They felt the sex work was inherently immoral. They also don't like migrants, and it happens that all the sex workers in Goa were migrants. So the conflation of migration and sex work being bad brought together gave them a kind of strong populist religious impetus to push that demolition forward with a force that maybe other governments might not have. But what happened in the immediate aftermath? What we found is that there was a huge amount of uncertainty and loss of income in the build-up to the demolition. There's a time period between the High Court judgment to when the demolition happened. And you see people saying, after the customer entered the locality, police used to beat them up and take money from them. The girls should run away from here. They should not stay here. This is what they used to say. Because Bainer was closed, we started going out for dates. These were short-term visits to lodges for the sake of survival. Otherwise, we would have died of starvation since the whole thing was banned by the police. And clearly, this reorganization had two different dimensions to it. One was that you found sex workers from Bainer going to other areas and displacing the women that already work there. Now I find it difficult to earn even 100 rupees because the market is flooded with Vasco Baina girls. They tell me they're not allowed to do this business in Vasco. Their huts have been demolished. So they felt that they were being displaced by these more professional sex workers from the brothel area. But also, new girls came into the vacuum that was left by some of the women that had vanished. 
No, these girls are not ex binder sex, sex workers. They used to come to Mangor before binder demolition also. But in those days, nobody was interested in them because even though they were young, they looked ugly, their clothes were dirty, and they smelled bad. But after the binder demolition, the situation changed. The same dirty, smelly rag pickers have become like gold. So you have this change in turnover, change of women that are working, which I'll explain why it matters later. The environment became more risky, so women described that they were working in unfamiliar settings they weren't used to, they didn't have the community support they were used to in the red light area, and they didn't know how to negotiate safety. Three guys from Bombay had booked her for a night, but the pilot had taken money for one full night plus a full day. When the girl wanted to leave, the clients refused to let her go and locked her up inside the lodge. But also, there was a sense in which there wasn't the sort of monetary support they used to have, there wasn't the safety net they used to have, and also health was a much lower priority. Earlier, if we did not have enough money, someone would give us 10, 20 rupees with which we could run our domestic life. But now, even if you ask, there is no one who can give you a single rupee. So that safety net which they were used to had gone, all of which meant they were less likely to negotiate condom use. So we had a change from a very concentrated, very visible, very brothel-based, homogeneous sex work, following a dem demolition into a very dispersed, clandestine, majority non-brothel-based, and much more heterogeneous sex work with different women coming in that hadn't previously worked. We did a survey of women afterwards, and out of the 326 women that we surveyed, they worked in 500 different places. So it was a much wider dispersion of places they worked, which of course makes it much more difficult to do interventions. So here it brings us to this issue why it matters having a high turnover. And this is something that I'll just show you from Goa, but it's something that's seen in many other settings, particularly in India. So if you take STIs, the yellow bar, sexually transmitted infections are a good marker, a good proxy of recent sexual risk because gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, you catch them, you get treated, they go. So they're very much a good proxy for somebody who's had recent sexual risk, whereas something like HIV is something which shows a much longer term risk because you catch it once, you can't keep recatching it. So you'll see that the women that are under the age of 20 had incredibly high prevalences of gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis. Those are the two sexually transmitted infections we tested for. Half of them had infections, so they have a very high recent sexual risk. The HIV prevalence was still lower and it very rapidly rose to about 25% and then plateaued. So you see that there's a very small window of opportunity when women are young within which we can prevent them from catching HIV. It's very soon after initiation. And this is again mirrored in the data that when you look at the data on a time in sex work. So you find the same thing. Condom use is very low in people who just started sex work. The sexual transmitted infections are fairly high and their HIV is still quite low. Very rapidly, the condom use goes up, but then for some of them it's too late because they've already contracted HIV, and you see this HIV transmission goes up as they get older. And this is a thing that we see throughout India, all suggesting that the period after initiation is very critical to supporting and protecting women, and it's very difficult to do that if you have a very high turnover and change in women. And the more kind of broader factors, when we looked at the factors that were associated with sexually transmitted infection, many of them are markers of gender disadvantages, as you would imagine them, being young, not having schooling, not having financial autonomy, deliberate self-harm, childhood sex abuse, are all strong predictors of finding a sexually transmitted infection. On the other hand, people who had access to some form of sexual health service, had some degree of HIV knowledge, had a lower risk of sexually transmitted infections. We were doing a study of suicide risk at the same time, and we found very similar markers, very similar predictors of people who were, had a very high risk of suicide. Again, intimate partner violence, violence from others, feeling entrapped, poor mental health, whereas having a child and having had exposure to HIV prevention, again, seemed to be a marker of less risk. And I just think, for the purpose of the audience, to get some feeling of the violence that we're talking about. It, these, are very, these are very, very common themes and very, very harsh, but give you some feeling of the violent societies from which women have come from. So this is about her childhood. My elder sister too had run away with her lover and married him. She was thrashed very badly because of love. I'd seen that, so I thought I too would be thrashed like her, and fearing this, I ran away and consequently came into sex work. My father used to beat my mother after getting drunk, another woman, but also very, violent experiences of sex from a very young age. I was 10 years old when they took me out of school and married me. He was a nice man, but he gave me trouble in bed. I was not mature enough. Another woman was saying, I was not sleeping with my husband. He forced himself upon me, and hence I got pregnant. It was like a rape scene, she said in a Hindi movie, and laughed. But this was probably the most disturbing and such a ubiquitous story amongst all the in-depth interviews that we 
read a very, very, very severe intimate partner violence. He threw me on the ground and broke my head. The people of the village gathered around and watched. What did his sister do? My blood was spilled on the ground. I was bleeding profusely and blood was everywhere. But she, along with her 12-year-old daughter, brought some ash from the kitchen and sprinkled it on the blood stain so it wouldn't look so horrible. There was a sense that not only was it very common, but also was a very acceptable form of experience for a woman in a, in a marital relationship. So the other thing that we looked at also was to see whether there was a difference between the women who'd been brothel-based compared to these newer women that were coming into the sex trade. And what we found is that women who had been part of the Biner red light area before its demolition were 30% less likely to have a sexually transmitted infection, 100 times more likely to use condoms consistently, and 20 times more likely to have had exposure to HIV prevention. So they were, broadly speaking, more able to protect themselves. So in summary, the sex work after the demolition was more diverse and much more dispersed. The destruction of that area made led to a much more high-risk working environment for the sex workers. And this vulnerability, I'd like to stress, was come, happens very early after initiation. So it's the very new sex workers that fill a vacuum after change in sex trade for whatever reason that are particularly vulnerable. And that many of the societal factors, particularly those associated with gender disadvantage and gender-based violence, talking about women's day, are associated with sexual risk as well as mental health risk. And there's this clustering of these in many settings. But interestingly, and maybe more positively, access to services did seem to provide some protection, suggesting that it's not a bad thing to have services there for people. So in conclusion of those two stories, although structural determinants are complex and these studies are by no means perfect, there's a suggestion that community mobilization did increase the power to access services and, and ch transform your risk environment, whereas coercive measures on the other side created a more hazardous working environment. And in a very simplistic way, if you take our original conceptual model, it would seem that coercive measures are like a red negative structural interventions, which make that environment more difficult to negotiate versus mobilization, which is a more positive factor. And so what are the implications? On the one hand, clearly we need to scale up these interventions that we know work, and it seems ridiculous that we don't, but we clearly need an environment in which it's possible to do that scale up, and that's where the issue about having an enabling environment matters. We also need some more robust evidence on which interventions improve those structural factors that underlie sex workers' in vulnerability. I think one way we can do that is where these scale-ups are being done rapidly, that very, very well-designed evaluations are incorporated so that we can look prospectively at the effect of rapid scale-up on empowerment and health outcomes and see how the various different aspects work. But finally, I think it's most important to remember that none of this should be happening without the engagement and involvement of sex workers. And you know, the no decision with, about me without me, I think, is more than any, any time important with the case of sex work. But I'm going to say, take a slight detour as well. We have seen these declines in, remember at the very beginning I said, we have seen these declines in HIV incidents across the world. And there's been very dramatic declines in South Asia. Those declines are primarily because sex workers are using condoms with their clients and therefore protecting their clients from the onward transmission of HIV and thus protecting the general population from HIV. However, as I showed you, they are very vulnerable to getting it very early, so they're not necessarily protecting themselves and they remain in low and middle income countries with very high prevalences. So the, the interventions we're doing are protecting the general population but not protecting the people most vulnerable who are being targeted with those interventions. So I think we should maybe move away from a 19th century approach of pathologizing and criminalizing the female genitalia and sex work as we do. A nice quote from Emil Zola, Venus was decomposing. It was as if the poison from which she had poisoned a whole people had now risen to her face and rotted it. And move towards reminding ourselves that antiretroviral therapy rollout in South Africa and Africa has really impacted on life expectancy. And I think the least that we can do on a moral ethical level is to argue that that degree of life expectancy success, which you can see here, these huge rises in life expectancy globally, but even in low and middle income countries, should also translate to increasing life expectancy in the sex workers that have, we have not managed to protect because of the social environment in which we allow them to work in. So if HIV is an occupational hazard, we have a duty to protect women or treat that occupational hazard, which they have now been infected. This work has been, of course, funded by quite a few different funders, Wellcome Trust, 
funded the work in Goa. Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have funded all the Avahan um, data that was used. The World Bank funded the work around community mobilization. There's a lot of partners that I have to acknowledge and a very large team of investigators that have allowed us to collect this data. The actual methods are much more detailed. If you want to see any more about the studies, you can look at the um, publications which describe the methods in more detail. And finally, I think we really need to thank the sex workers of Baina and the sex workers of Karnataka that allowed us to work with them and share this data, which I think does make a difference in terms of how we should look at protecting some of our most vulnerable women. Thank you. Ten minutes of session. Thank you, Mariam. Uh, do we have any questions? One question here. There's a mic is just coming towards you. Hold on a minute. Can you hold on a minute? There's a mic. Thank you. I found that very interesting. Um, I'm working more generally in poverty and health in India. Um, I have a broad sort of macro question. Um, are most of the um, sex workers, daughters of mothers who have previously been sex workers, or are they a consequence of rural poverty and rural urban migration? There's a mix, and I think, so you have an older, so in Karnataka there's a very large section of the Devadasi girls, which are women that were from the Devadasi tradition, which if you don't know, the Devadasi tradition was a tradition in which girls were donated to temples. They were meant to really be donated to temples for working in temples, but ended up being donated into sex work, so it became a sort of religious type of sex work. So that is a very strong tradition, and many of the children of sex workers do become sex workers, but there's also a very large influx of new women um, into sex work, which are from those quite violent and dysfunctional families that I described, and, and rural poverty and rural urban migration. But also, I mean, to balance it, so for example, the dirty rag, tic, rag picker story, those women, uh, Lam Lamani women, they would earn 80 rupees a day for a full day of work in sort of uh, doing, um, construction, roads construction, the men would earn 120 rupees. If they could get a, a turn a trick for about an hour, they would get the same 80 rupees. So the balance was between whichever came first, if they got a, a job or if they got the other kind of job. So it's quite complex in that setting to dissociate the financial benefits. And the interesting thing from our women was that often they were financially more um, secure than before they become sex workers. So it, it's, it was quite complex. Thank you. Any other questions? You've spotted one, oh, haven't no, you? No. Someone at oh, the back? Oh, yes, there's somebody at the back. No, they want no, no. the we, loudspeaker we thing because other it. people are listening. Sorry. I'm just wondering how you collected or how you sampled the female sex workers. So it was different in different settings. So the Karnataka sex workers are part of two large surveys. One was the IBBA, the Integrated Behavioral and Biological Survey run by um, the government, which is a very, very large survey, but they use very good um, time motion sampling as well as RDS for respond driven sampling, depending on the setting. So there's quite a lot of mapping of sex work, then depending on the setting, it's either time location sampling, proportional of brothels, or respond driven sampling in some settings. The Goa one was a respond driven sample, which we took after the uh, demolition, because that's the only way we could access the women who were quite hidden. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, okay. it seems as, was that a hand up or? I think no. there's someone there in the corner. No, 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 there's somebody just. Hi, I know in Canada they've been dealing with a lot of new legislation pursuant to situations with brothels and I was wondering how you thought that this research could be extended to other communities and sex workers in other countries. I mean, I think this is not the only research and there's quite a lot of other pieces from other parts of the world. I think the, the two things I say, I think that I would listen in any setting to what sex worker organizations generally say. And generally, in most settings, they would argue that anything that makes their work more difficult or more criminalized, they would be against. So most sex workers are against the, the criminalization of clients, for example, in the UK, which is planned in the UK and has happened in um, Scandinavian countries, and I think the French are quite keen to do, because it makes, it pushes them undercover, it makes their life more difficult. Uh, they, so I think, I mean, I would, I would listen to what they say, because they're the people that are involved, as in any other setting. If you're talking about, you know, minors, you would ask the minors what they want, you wouldn't decide that you think mining's a bad thing, so it should be banned. 
it's, it, it was dangerous and it, you don't ban it because it's dangerous. So I think it's listening to what they say. The other thing is it's also about coverage and making sure that if you do change legislation, you look at what the impact is very quickly and there are ways that you can assess the impact. Does it push people off the street? Does it put them in more dangerous circumstances than they were in before? Thank you. Um, there is one at the back there. Controversial. What does the Indian government do to reduce the number of sex workers apart from the measures you told us about in your lecture? I think there are, uh, reducing the number of sex workers is actually more of a priority for most governments because the anti-trafficking, the money that goes into trafficking and reducing sex workers is usually more than there is that goes into harm reduction. The issue is quite difficult unless you really look at massive changes. So what you really need to be thinking about is huge social change where women have far more choices. So these, these are women with very few choices in terms of work other than sex work. Their other choices would be to work in, as a maid where they often get raped anyway and they get paid much less. Or as I said, working in construction where they get paid very little. So it's working much more downstream around firstly, get women becoming aware of what happens to them when they come to cities, because often they're not fully aware. The women that we worked with were very naive about the whole sexuality issue. It all happened to them quite out of, out in surprise, even though many of them had been married. It's reducing the violence and dysfunctionality, and it's what we saw in the West, you know, growth in women's rights ultimately will push, sec would push the number of sex workers down. And I, I, can see, I can't see that you can do it through legislation. There's nowhere in the world that legislation has reduced the sex work. Where sex work has been reduced in the Western countries, it was parallel to very strong women's movements and a very greater equality and greater advantage for women. And I think that's essentially the route we take. Yeah, so enabling women to stay longer in education would yep. perhaps reduce the number. Yeah, so enabling women to stay longer in education, which is, there are a lot of interventions. There's actually intervention in Karnataka Africa specifically around children of sex workers to try and help them through cash transfer, stay in education longer. But you still also need to say then, once they stayed in education longer, what is for, there for them after that? So there are women, even fairly educated women, where there aren't that many opportunities for them because there is, isn't work. But the way, global, the way kind of economic development in India has happened is not one in which there's been a huge amount of growth in manufacturing or growth in, in lower skilled work. It's been very much at the high skill level um, where global capital is kind of transferred out. So there, aren't, there haven't been that many opportunities across men and women, so migrant men also in very difficult, very dangerous work that they do because there aren't any opportunities. Um, well, I can't see any other questions. It looks as though you've answered everything. Exactly. Thank you very much. I think you'd like to join me in thanking Dr. Shamanesh once more for her lecture. Thank you.